Hey everybody, thanks for listening again today. It's Tuesday, you're listening to Collexit Radio Mach 2.0 and today I have with me again John Pomeroy Jr. Let me have him introduce himself and yes, California because that's going to become important during this radio show as we are seeing from yes, California uh, more of this push toward uh, secessionism that we're seeing reflected in the rest of the world and John is really uh, the one of the current experts on this. Um, take it away, John. Thank you, Sue. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, just want a brief introduction. Um, Long time political activist, um, really fed up with the duopoly and corporatism in general, and don't really see an, a possibility for a solution within the current system. Um, they've been trying to uh, rectify it for decades to reform uh, the system from within. And it's just so deeply entrenched in colonialism and uh, patriarchy. Um, we don't even have the language to deal with the problems that we're facing. So I believe that uh, these reasons and many more are why uh, secessionism is such a, a prolific conversation these days and why, yes, California is really um, leading the movement globally um, to create a coalition of secessionist movements and uh, hoping to build on the success of uh, Catalan. Uh, John, can you tell us more about how you mean that we're leading the movement globally? Yeah, California um, has long been acting as uh, as an independent um, on the world stage. California was the only non nation at the uh, at the, the climate accord in Paris. Um, our governor is, um, at least on, on paper, um, very green minded, um, we're the fourth largest economy in the world now. We just passed, uh, England. Um, we have, uh, an incredible opportunity that, uh, that nations don't have same reason why uh, why the United States is struggling so much. Too big to govern. Right. I, I think that's about right. I think that uh, Washington, D.C. needs to be out of California's business and that they, they are just incapable of knowing or caring uh, what we want and need here in California because we're so far away and we're so different from uh, most of the rest of the states of the United States. Um, do you agree with that, John? Yes and no. Um, we're, we're different in history in regards to um, in regards to different treaties that have been written. Um, I would I would argue that California is more of a reflection of the entire country, which is why I feel like it would function so well as an independent nation. You have um, you know, liberal bastions within um, the metropolitan areas of Sacramento, uh, San Francisco, Oakland, um, Los Angeles. You have uh, conservative bastions uh, all over, um, you know, the hill country and um, the rural parts of California, as well in as in um, very conservative um, parts of the state like Orange County. Um, but all of those places have a good representation of progressivism. And what I think is the biggest problem with our current reality is that the only thing that we hear about in the corporate mainstream media is a small percentage of the populace. 
we have, um, you know, all of this conversation about about fascists and Antifa, and that represents a minuscule percentage of the reality. The vast majority of people are so disenfranchised with the system, they don't even go out to vote. They realize how corrupt the system is and what a joke the, du the duopoly is and have seen voting for lesser of two evils over and over and over and over in their lifetime. And it, it's just a joke. And as soon as there's a, a glimmer of hope with a candidate like Bernie Sanders, um, that same duopoly undermines it and, uh, and marginalizes the voices of all of the dispossessed. So we have a system that is tragically flawed and it serves only the wealthy and we need a major, major overhaul if we're going to, um, if we're going to uh, get away from all of the problems that ail us and uh, a free and independent California give us the opportunity to to start fresh and have conversations about what could be done if we redirected all of the resources that are currently being wasted into something that's more sustainable and um, and just. Now hold that thought for just a second, John, because you brought up a really great point. And I want to nutshell the point and then have you speak to it a little bit. And the point was that capitalism is killing us. Extractive capitalism. Keep on, I don't please. Think, I don't think capitalism as a whole is the problem. I think much as the same way as communism wasn't the problem, it was the hierarchy um, that managed it. It's more of a problem with uh, the type of government that implements the facets of capitalism rather than um, you know capitalism itself um, from an idealist perspective um, any of the political um, possibilities um, have pros and cons have an ability to um, to do something um, good for the communities that they manage, but they're always historically corrupted by corrupt men in power. Exactly, exactly. Okay, now can you take us, uh, can you connect the dots for us and take us from there to uh, maybe a solu some possible solutions? Well, there's, there are many and, and also, um, John, can you speak yeah. more into your phone or make yourself a little louder somehow? Uh, I'll do my best. Okay. Is that better? No. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> How about now? That's a little better. Even even more if you can. All right. I'll do my best. Okay. So, um, yeah, the solutions are many. Um, first and foremost, I believe that education is, um, what will save us. Uh, if we educate our children in a way that nurtures respect for the other, for the environment, for, um, life in general, for harmonizing with our environment, uh, I feel like that would be uh, first and foremost. If you look at the facets of permaculture, for example, um, you can't look at any single thing in a vacuum because all of those things are interrelated. So you can't talk about a sustainable system unless all of the pieces of that system are sustainable. So just because you have solar power and gray water and rainwater catchment um, on your globally distributed product doesn't mean that it's sustainable. And if you're existing within an economic system, which only benefits 
a few, then no matter how sustainable the production of that product is, if it's being distributed within that um, corrupt system, um, it is immediately, uh, you know, brought down a rung. Yeah, that's true. So, it's it's kind of yeah. like that old saw that if you have a perfectly clear glass of water, but then you put a tiny, tiny drop of food coloring in it, it's no longer clear. That's right. So you have a, that's a great analogy too. Yeah, and it only takes one bad apple to ruin the bunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's for sure. Yeah, it's... Um, it's a complicated reality, and uh, we know that from nature's perspective, uh, there's a balance. Human beings have inarguably disrupted that balance, and it's not until we make significant efforts to restore it that we are going to um, reverse uh, all of the problems that we have in our current system. Right, right. And I think California is uniquely positioned to lead the conversation on what a more uh, sustainable system would look like. Something I want to mention is that we are constantly corrupting the system uh, or are, you know, with our uh, capitalistic culture and a lot of us aren't even aware uh like about nike yes they're using the face of colin kaepernick and that's a great thing uh they're using him for uh you know to you know they're they're doing it not to get out his message but because his face is uh significant to their bottom line and at the same time they're running sweatshops overseas in order to make the shoes that they're selling using his face and they're you know the the sweatshop conditions are just terrible and the pay is worse and and none of us are aware Nobody's aware of this. We're all uh, just aware of this great move they made, supposedly, to back Colin Kaepernick's message. Um, we're all aware that they're using his face, so we're all going out and buying Nikes and condemning others for burning Nikes because they don't like the message and they don't like black people, black athletes kneeling. But we're not aware of what goes on behind the scenes and what the uh, CEOs do and how the businesses are actually run that we uh, we patronize. Um, so we have to make ourselves more aware of that. And I'm looking here at something also about Starbucks. And I've heard something about how they run their business behind the scenes as well. Um, and, uh, you know, no, no big business is really exempt uh, from uh, morals, common, common sense and, and morals. We all really, really should, but not everyone does live by a moral code or a moral standard that matches uh, that of regular people even. And, and it seems to me that the bigger you are, the more you have a sacred duty to set an example for other people that you know, that see you because you're in the public eye. John, yeah, you again, you're talking about uh, a message. When you say nobody, uh, nobody realizes that we have these problems, um, I think that nobody, um, nobody is held, um, nobody who realizes these things um, is having their voice broadcast in much the same way that nobody who is doing really necessary and positive work is getting paid very much. The only way that you can make millions um, and be comfortably um, settled is by doing something um, that, that doesn't necessarily benefit humanity. Um, right. There are obviously exceptions to that, but generally speaking, I mean, look at school teachers.